Happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody. March 17th, 2019, another episode of White Belt MMAs. The S is for sciences, mixed martial arts and sciences, that is. Henokelias, Rastin, Karami. We have a lot to talk about today. I think it'd be great if we started off with a big picture kind of philosophical discussion about decisions and head to toe, really. Like, what are they? But first. What is their roles? But first. Should we discuss how maybe we should be Soma? Or is it, are we going to stick to the game plan? What is that? Is that the drug from the Aldous Huxley novel? No, I think we'll Brave just... Brave New World? <laughs> I think we'll just throw that as a teaser. Soma. Think about that. Um, Don't let him bait you. <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of... Uh, you want to talk about the decisions last night? Or do you want to go through... I want to talk about decisions. But before we go into the specifics of the UFC or boxing or kickboxing or the grappling exchanges, gi and no gi. Mm -hmm. What do you think about decisions? Oh, wow. We're going to get it. That's real deep. That's what so, I'm saying. Yeah. That's what the space no, absolutely. is for. Um, I think what really personified the argument was, and I know that it wasn't the opener fight and it wasn't even the main event, and it was the co-main event, and that was Gunner versus Leon Edwards. And it really, like, b breaks it down very easy for me. And that's how you view a fight. Is a fight over when the time is up, or is a fight over when a man is unable to continue? And I know that Gunner believes that it should be to the finish. And whereas Leon is playing it by the books and thinks that it's like, if I do enough in the time period that's told to me, then I get the win. Quick question on that. Is that status quo or the future ideal? So are you saying Gunner and Leon, their ideal MMA situation if it were to be forming like their own promotion, their own rule set would be that? Or are you saying given the current rule set, this is what they strive for in the cage? I think that's the second, the latter for okay. sure. Um, and I think that they, they even interviewed Gunnar or they were speaking about it, that he actually said in an interview that that's how he believed the fight should be. And, um, and it really played out exactly like that question like popped up in my head because Leon dominated the first two rounds, third round came up, and then he was pretty, pretty much, I think he had given the third round as well. And then the final minute, Gunner ends up in mount and it was looking really bad and the time ran out and it looked like Leon wasn't doing anything. He wasn't, you know, trying to get the finish or trying, he was just stalling. And if you go by Gunner's philosophy, he's probably going to win that fight at the end of the day. And I, I tend to think that, you know, maybe Leon would fight differently if he, if he knew prior what type of fight it was going to be, he's just fighting with the rule set he's given. Yeah. But at the end of the day, what is the correct way in your opinion? So judges, doctors, mm -hmm. referees, mostly quacks, <laughs> mostly charlatans, mountebanks, oh, snake man. oil sales. You sound like Nassim Nicholas Taleb. So we're similar. But what I'd like to say is that I'm deeply disturbed by decisions. I think, like many things in this world, decisions should be abolished. And the reason I say that is if the postmoderns have contributed one thing to our knowledge base, it's about how much myriads or how many myriads or how, many, how much just a plethora of interpretations and how much subjectivity is in our world. And to me, I think your time, my time, the fans time, the commenters time, the analyst time is getting sucked. There are a few things in this world I hate more than what I view as useless time sucks. I think when we can be debating the merits of fighting, which styles are more efficient, which are more stylistic, you know, hinting at the title of this podcast, The Arts and the Sciences, I think we're wasting away our time. We're tossing it in a trash basket to, to have <laughs> these, these basic, basic discussions about decisions. And I, I really think of all the, the remedies and proposals I hear people have, I don't think any of them are good in regards to you know what can make it better. Right. Because ultimately, these people, the referees, the judges, the doctors have a certain amount of discretion and whatever worldviews and perceptions and thoughts and philosophies they have, 
go into that. And so they rule differently. That's one of the things you and I were discussing kind of before we got into podcast mode today is that people can do things differently and, and a little bit of discretion is fine, but there's far too much discretion. There's far too many disparities. And so I think if you leave things to finality and we've talked about this before, right? You know, if you take away gloves, if you take away rounds, if you take away weight limits, these are things that would allow more finishes to happen. If you counted everything that was not a uh, a submission or a KO or a TKO, yeah. if you counted that as a draw, you can... I think their incentives change. You talked about the incentive of Leon Edwards would be different. Right. I think the incentive of every fighter would be different sure. if you adjust the rule set. But given the current rule set, honestly, it's tough. If you ask me about that specific fight, I personally, if I was a judge, in my subjective opinion and view of the world, I would have ruled it 28-28 each. I would have given the first round 10-9 to Leon Edwards. Mm -hmm. The second round, 10-9, Leon Edwards. Mm -hmm. And he, he was able to show that he knows how to grapple. He even got he out wrestled him. Gunner in the first round, I would say. Arguably, I think it's easier to do defense more than offense. And what he did was more defensive he took wrestling. He did through through a, a counter defensive move. Sure. So you know you could you know controlling the cage or being the floor general, kind of pushing the pace is one of the many factors that goes into judging. But in any event, I give it to him, but I don't give it to him ten eight. Right. Because it's not like he ran over to go no, and no, threw no, him I'm down. With he you. did it on a good counter move. Ten nine is fine. 10 yeah. 9 is fine. So I would do that for both, and then he he clearly outstruck him. I don't think anyone debates that he right. outstruck him. Right. Gunner was but, having a hard time getting yeah. the range on Leon. Even in the third round, yeah. in the first few minutes, yeah. Gunner was losing it. But he got to the point where finally the the many attempts at taking down finally wore through. The grappling is a slow and steady tortoise-like race with the hair. And he eventually wore him down. He got past his guard a lot quicker than he did throughout the rest of the fight. Right. And then he spent the last 30 seconds to a minute on top of Mount. He wailed on him a little, but we could talk about it a little bit later. But that three piece of the soda from Jorge Masvidal looked like it did actually more damage to him. Bare knuckle outside the cage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in the cage, in the mount, he was hitting him up. Gunner was hitting up Leon, but he just he didn't make a, a, a huge move for submission. But for me, it looked like Leon lost the will to fight. Right. He just wrapped around. And using no efficiency, he just held on for his dear life, hoping that his biceps don't burst. Which and at the post fight, could be seen as smart. It, it's one Within tactic. The current real sense. It's one yeah. tactic, but there's no guarantee on how the, the judges decide. And in fact, differently than me, one of the judges gave two rounds to Gunner, which is even different than what I would have said. I would have said draw 10-8 right. round for the last round, and I right. would have given it 10-8 to Gunner because he ended in mount. And there was no attempt at escape. He didn't go for half guard. He didn't oompa. He didn't bridge. He didn't do anything. He didn't even punch from the bottom, as we've seen some people do. He didn't Ezekiel from bottom, as we've seen Alexi Olenek do, one of my yeah. favorite fighters. He didn't do anything but just hold, hold. He hodored from right. there. He yeah. hodled from there. Right. Like, what was he doing? So for me, I can't believe you pulled a Game of Thrones and a <laughs> Bitcoin reference back to back. Beautiful. Those are for the deep fans. So like, I, but, okay, I'm sorry speaking... is long winded, but that's my point is they should be abolished. But given the current state, honestly, I would have given this fight a draw. Wow. You know, I don't know if I could say a draw. I could see your point about Gunner if had more time could have got the finish because I, Leon did win, in my opinion, the first three or four minutes of that final round as well. So within the current rule set, I can't say that that Gunner took that round. Would you give all three rounds to him, or would it have been? Yeah, I think Gunner? for me it would have been a uh, decision uh, unanimously all three rounds. Ten nine all or ten eight eight. Ten nine all of them, um, and I. For me, you hit the head nail on the head right there when you said deep fans, and I know you were talking about our references that you were talking Hodling about. Hodling and Hodor. Yeah, because I think for us it would be more interesting to watch like a 15 minute round or like, you know, like, or an unlimited time round. No time limit, baby. Right. It would be interesting to <laughs> no us. No rounds either. But we have to remember that mixed martial arts and the UFC only exist because of the business model. Like people aren't going to put this out there for free. Like it's not going to be like, maybe you can buy backyard boxing, like 
Jorge Masvidal and Kimbo Slice, like, you know, someone's recording in somebody's house, but it exists currently because it has fans, because people watch it. And I don't know how many of those fans are non-casual, that are really like looking at how a fight breaks down, how the tactics work out, how people are game planning for a fight. They wanna see violence or they wanna see fast paced grappling. And for me, you're gonna end up, some of those fights that are long and you know, or unlimited time limit would end up exciting and fast paced, but some of them are gonna be a little like Usman Woodley, where it's one guy dominating and holding a guy down for 30, 40 minutes. That was titillating. I'm, for us, for <laughs> us titillating, but I'm not entirely sure. I don't think we're alone. I think there's a huge number, and I think people like you and I, especially in this world that has increasing customization and individualization, would be willing put, to put up the money sure. for a left way MMA. <laughs> I'm not with arguing. No I'm not arguing timelines. that there's no other people other than us. I'm saying you might not. The, I think the the fear in the UFC executive's mind and all the other promotions' mind is that they're not going to be able to pull off the Conor Khabib 2.5 million buys pay per view in that setting. And I think that's where the issues lie yeah. in, with the current rule set. I I, I disagree. Way. I think the UFC took off in the beginning, the first five, under the guidance of Horion Gracie, who looked at fighting objectively and had as little rules as possible. It was Vale Tulo, which is Portuguese, right? For no holds barred. And, you know, people used to call it NHB as well, right? No holds barred. Right. And I think the less rules, the more creativity, and it, it was great. That's how the UFC originally sold. I believe that the concessions were made in name for entertainment purposes, like right. your listing. But I think the real push behind them were all of the Puritans that were trying to make MMA illegal. And I think that they have lost. I think it's so deep in the culture now that we don't have to worry about legislators as much. And so I think now we can go back to the rules of at least the first five UFCs. But see, this is what I always talk about, like when, when I'm trying to like think about if I regret a decision, you know, and I'm thinking about like, if I had done something differently, this might have ended up better. But you know, the UFC got to how big it was because of the decisions made, because of the changes made. It, it's possible that maybe it would have got as big under Horion's guidance alone. The whole way. That's not entirely, uh, you know, we're not we 100%. Don't know. On yeah, that. we don't know. But it got to where it is as the biggest promotion. It got to ESPN through the changes it went through. I mean, it got here. So mm -hmm. saying, going back and saying, oh, it would have been the same the other way is kind of like guesswork. You know, we don't know. It's guesswork both ways. Because sure. what got us to the dance doesn't mean it's always going to get us here because things evolve. Right. And at the same time, what got us through the initial part isn't necessarily better than what we adapted. Right. So I think both are guesswork. No, for sure. I agree. And I think that there was a lot of things from last night's card that, you know, under a setting that we had... UFC you know, you London 2019. Huh? UFC London 2019. Yeah, we would have enjoyed if it was under those circumstances of unlimited rounds and not having to worry about judges' decisions or referee decisions or, you know, some of these things. And there were many examples of that last night. Like, Go to that exact fight. Which exact Leon fight? Edwards right. versus Gunnar Nelson mm -hmm. in our ideal MMA style. Right. Do you think it plays out any differently? See... You could say that Gunnar would have won the fight because he finishes him in that third round setting where he mounts him. But I keep going back to this point. If Leon knows the rule set initially, knows what he has to do, he changes his whole game plan. So we I can't agree. say that that's going to be end up exactly the same way. I agree. But if it was, and they ended up in that position, if you're asking me what would have happened, I think Gunnar finishes him. But that's it's back to fun, It's funny you say this, and I know you like it when I throw these random references to you, so mm -hmm. let me throw another one oh, at I you. Oh, I love it. Please hit me. Please. The argument you just made reminds me exactly about some of the political debates about who won the popular vote and who won the electoral college vote in the last presidential election in the United States okay. and about how, sure they, see it how their strategies would have adjusted had, for example, the popular vote been the means by which you would elect the president as opposed to the electoral college. Right. So it's interesting. You're saying basically the same thing I was saying, that the rules and incentives are the things that have the most importance and value 
more so than you know any individual that you would place in the system and I, I think that's right like individuals and systems are important but systems are more important uh, I could I'd probably give you equally important I think that I, if I was in there against Gunnar Nelson it would be a different story you know I don't know how much preparation I would need for that you know for real for um, real but yeah no it's not just that though it's like even some of those decisions like that went crazy last night that I was like oh I don't know about this and we gotta think about if three judges is the correct way to go and I know that Joe always suggests Joe Rogan uh, always suggests look who brought him up this time ladies and gentlemen <laughs> He always suggests the 10 judges or getting more yeah. judges just so that you get kind of... Which I think is crazy, by the way, because an even number is dumb. So I was a judge in high school debate. I did college debate. And, you know, I have a background in the law as well. And the thing is, odd numbers work best for judges. No, of course. So, okay, so arbitration panels. Yeah. Yeah. So it's three right now. Mm -hmm. Five, seven, nine. Right. Those are all good numbers. I think even could, 11 if you want to go, but 10 even numbers don't work yeah, for judges. My could, professional opinion, y'all want to pay me for consulting, hook it up. But think about it though. Like what the odds of getting a 5-5 five, five scorecard are lower than getting like another cuz there's so many people would have to be in I don't even want to put it on the table. Right, but I'm just saying the chance would be lower. But I, I agree. see your point. Agreed. I see your point. But think about if you have the odd number to get a draw if Everyone has to agree. I know. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Can you definitely. imagine seven or nine people agreeing that it was a draw? Then, right. Like the, no, and, but and I, they're experts. No, like, but like fighters of MMA. But the, that goes back to you saying fans. you you go back to you saying that every decision is a draw. I agree. So like forget <laughs> that. Throw that out the window. You know. What would GSP <laughs> really look like? Man, GSP would have a lot but of draws. His incentives. His last like, seven fights of the incentives. Of course, that's back to that argument again. So um, going back to decisions no, that, that we was, potentially disagree with. Yeah, man, I wanted to go into that, and that was I love the kid too. I love Dominic Reyes. I think he's like one of the a great prospect, but he lost that fight. To That's Volkan. a light heavyweight fight. Who did he fight? Volkan. No time. No time. Ozdemir. And I thought Volkan was better all around. I thought you know maybe uh, he you know Dominic got around the edges a little bit and got you know from a distance. Fought a decent fight. Had a, probably almost the next same amount of striking statistics as Volkan did. But I think Volkan did the more damage. I think Volkan was pressing more. I, I mean, I just couldn't see it being a split decision for Dominic. So they boxed each other. And I'd say Ozdemir wins in the boxing. They started kicking. And Reyes wins from a distance. Gets a knockdown with it. But Ozdemir knocks him was down with a, a kick was too. Was that a knockdown? Yeah, with a kick. Really? He, it was like a kick trip. It was a leg kick um, that took him. The, but they did it too. Then Ozdemir answered back with his right, own. Right. But How then on top of that, going? on top of that, Ozdemir had more takedowns. Right, and that's the, that's the thing about <laughs> Volkan. He really surprised me because I think like he really took that loss to Anthony Smith to heart, where he was like, "Man, I'm not." As well rounded as I could be, he's and, been in he's a been rut. Rain. He's been in a rut. And I think he DC really... defended against him. Right, and Anthony think... beat him. Did anyone else beat him that we know? Um, not that I remember. But he's been on a, a down streak, and he was. I think he went down to hard knocks, and uh, or he stopped going down to hard knocks and trained in Europe or something. Yeah. He had changed something up and focused on um, all assets rather than just trying to knock someone out in the first round, no time. Trying to Quick side him. note: I thought he was like a deep vet because I know. Homeboy Dominic Reyes is an IT guy who's yeah, kind yeah, of newer. Yeah, yeah. I looked up their ages are like the same, and they're I, both I super think, young. And I think Volkan only has like five more fights than. Uh, than yeah, Dominic's but he's time. been top ten for a while, and well, Dominic no, just that's entered. the thing with Volkan. He came in versus a ranked guy for his first UFC fight. He came in OSP, with so much right? hype. I might be OSB, yeah. yeah. He came in like undefeated from the European circuit and he was a hot prospect, so they threw him into the fire right away. And, yeah. and credit to him, he stayed in that ranking yeah. for a UFC, time. MMA, or any Dutch boxing type situation? No, I don't, I think he was a kickboxer, but don't quote me on that. I'm not yeah. entirely sure. So, but Dominic had to earn his way into the top yeah. 10, whereas Volkan has been a top 10 fighter this whole time. I didn't, I didn't fully answer you, so let me answer you in short. Yeah, who won that fight? I don't know. So you said and, draw? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't like decisions. Right. I said that. I want to abolish decisions. I would have been more okay with a draw on than that a split one. decision win for uh, Dominic. I would have been more okay with. Yeah. I'd say at worst for yeah. Volkan, it was Was a it even split or you know? It was a split decision Man. Dominic. Yeah. Uh, honestly, I wouldn't have been surprised either way. But if you, if I had to be pinned down, 
in the current system, I think I would have given it to Ozdemir and I would have based it on the takedowns. The striking, maybe they were the sheer them. numbers. Maybe. They were equal. The numbers I were didn't close. See. The numbers yeah. were close. But, you know, like, not every strike is created equally, too. That's what I'm saying. Volkan so hit him with the bigger it's ones. It's difficult. And the thing is, I think Volkan hurt his nose at some point because Dominic was labored towards the second you know, round or whatever. He was like, Yeah, the commentators yeah. were, were yeah, saying he how like, he was breathing out of his mouth. And it, I, they mentioned something about him going to Elevation Fight Team in yeah, Colorado. Colorado. I think, isn't that what Curtis Blades is? Or all yep. the people? And Overeem, who's yeah, also so working with Wim Hof, like Diego he, Sanchez is. Oh, uh, yeah. He went to a, a big camp and a place that's known for a high elevation, like really getting your stamina up. And his stamina was not good. I don't know if it's because he got hurt, but... Yeah, he's... you know, there's something I learned a long time ago, and, and you can argue maybe his sparring rounds would be contrary to this, but, you know, I've done running, and then I've done things like football and rugby. And one of the things I learned about football and rugby versus running is there's one form of endurance where you just move, <coughs> excuse me, and there's another form of endurance when, thank you, when there's a man hitting you. Right. And banging with you. Right, no. So that might be, you know, the veteran Ozdemir. Like, that might be part of the strategy. Even when I play recreational basketball, you know, you see me play, people get, who think they have stamina, they lose their stamina around me because I'm very physical. A lot of people just want to have a shooting contest, but it's a contact sport. So I like to bring it to you. And this was a match where both of them were bringing it to each other. No one was particularly running from the other. Dominic ran away a little bit more. It could have been a fist Ozdemir. that messed up his passageway in his nose. Very possible. You know. Could have been some of the body shots too. He mixed yeah. it up. Back and forth, man. Right. No, I, I, I it goes to another point. Even if you have to do decisions like, is it a time issue that we do these three-rounders? Can everything yeah, be fine? Course. No, no, Man. because it's a... At least on the main issue. card? You, you, can we get five rounds on because You know how long, for years, people have been complaining about the length of the UFC cards, and actually the pacing... They're of, quick now. The pacing of ESPN is much faster than oh Fox. Oh my God, they're Fox quick. was like, we have to stay up until like one in the morning to finish Bro, this up. went from like one to 3.50. It was done. I was already late on my way home. Yeah. I had to catch up on the other fights. Right. I came in right during the Dominic Ozdemir fight. Oh, wow. That's a good Beginning place. of it. Yeah, you missed a great one with Nathaniel Wood, but... Talk what to I was me saying, about it. But I'm saying no, but going back to the issue of of the timing is like you can't have every fight be five rounds. Because like you would be up till it'd be two days. It'd be a two day <laughs> event. Every every Like day, I said, know? man. I'm yeah. deep in it. Yeah, I know. You would like that, but some people would not. Um, especially the people buying. So talk to me about the fight that I missed. If they know what, I really was impressed by him. I I knew of him peripherally as a prospect. Like I knew that he was coming up. I wasn't like entirely, you know, first on him. I know that he's good kind of everywhere. I knew that his boxing was really good. He's got like nine KOs. And he fought a guy that I was actually interested in, a Mexican fighter who was supposed to fight uh, Sugar, Sean O'Malley. Oh, yeah. And so that was, a bad that was right boy. before Sean popped. And then obviously that sucks for that dude. Yeah. Cause like, for caffeine pills? Right. We don't know what the diuretic. I think yeah. it's because that's something that helps him cut weight because Sean is tall as fuck for 135. Or like GSP said on the JRE, it might be. Something that helps with reaction time or endurance. It's all. It's not all necessarily yeah, yeah. this understanding that everyone's on TRT and the good right. super deep sure, no, 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 no. and they get jacked. No, he definitely doesn't look like he's on TRT. He's a skinny guy. But um, I think that I was looking forward to that fight because, like, that guy. The um, are they ranked or unranked? Mm, Nathaniel's gonna be ranked. Okay. That's for sure. Okay. I don't know if um, Jose was ranked, but. I was looking forward to, to that to the Sean fight with him because that's like that's a scrap where both of them are gonna go at it. So I was like kind of interested with this fight already because I knew the opponent of Nathaniel Wood and I knew that yeah. he was touted as a prospect and he really looked good. His grappling looked good. He got the finish with rear naked choke, and it was like I expected him to just be a striker and he had well rounded, well rounded. And he's a little small, not small, but like you know the five six. Five seven right, so he's not like a monster for the division. One thirty five, yeah. yeah. Especially yeah. when you have guys like Sugar Sean who are five eleven. Yeah, yeah. So he, I mean, but he could definitely go far. I, I, I'm interested to see a bunch of fights with him. Um, they could even give him a guy who's on a skid right now, but who could turn around or fight with Cody. Garbrandt would be interesting with him. Man, after two knockouts, he needs a little pick me up. Yeah, a little but Nathaniel, boxing Nathaniel style would be a uh, tough fight for him, you know. Fluff opponent. Yeah, I mean, although we also love Peter Yan against Cody Garbrandt. Don't get me started with no mercy. That might happen too. Woo! I like that. Uh, I'd have palpitations from that one. I'd like uh, it, man. But let's see what else in that. Quarter? The main event. Let's oh, talk about right. the main event. Can I start, uh, or you got something? Well, 
Jorge Masvidal. Please, no, Derek you know what? Jones. Let's hear. I want to hear what you think about that. Fight. Okay, first of all, we were playing Mortal. By the way, Kombat. when it was announced, I, I was so hyped because I fucking love Masvidal, and I was like, "This is a low key great fight." But I was low key disappointed because I wanted to see that Masvidal Nate that they were talking about. I wanted to see Nate versus uh, Dustin. Uh, I wanted to see Nate against a lot of people. A lot of Nate fights are going away. I don't know what's happening, but I wanted to say we were playing Mortal Kombat just the other day. <laughs> true. So this was. Fresh in my mind, I used Liu Kang as a character, uh -huh. and what do I see? Right when the bell rings, Jorge Masvidal does the Liu Kang flying kick, and I thought he was gonna KO him. Did with you think he was, quick, the, he was going? For but the he nuts. went for the gonad. You think he was going for the nuts, or was I think shot? that was it? It is, it is it? unfair to have an automatic assumption that he was going for the nuts. I agree. I agree. However, with the post-fight tactics. And the either white lie or bold face lie, depending on what perspective you're coming from, he told, or legal defense, if you're coming at it from a law perspective, oh, about, I have so many about his about that. interaction with I Leon so Edwards, you were about talking about. Yeah, but. I, I don't think anyone except Jorge knows for sure, but I do think overall he wants to have respect. I told you when we were leading up to this fight in our previous episode that I saw Dan Hardy sit both of them down at a table. And he's no master mediator, but he, you know, he fought in their division. He was a welterweight. That's true. And so he's not like some super imposing super heavyweight or something like By that. By the way. He's equal to them. I agree. Hold, on, hold your point. But Dan Hardy is smaller than Paul Felder. How fucking big is Paul Felder? I think Paul Felder's head is that big. But really? I, I, I when they stand next no. to him, I'm like, Paul Felder's bigger than Dan Hardy. Dan's taller. No. I... I don't know if he's wearing different shoes, but from my angle, when I saw him, we're gonna have to research this one. But continue your point. My about, point about sitting at the table is that right he sat them at a table before the fight, and it was all respect. Oh, it they, was respectful total, disagreement because respect. they had a dispute about who's better, and that was resolved in the cage via Jorge Masvidal KOing him. Listen, people don't talk shit about Jorge Masvidal. Like people like don't. Well, talk. people definitely do. I mean, they, he said uh, he has a lot of demons he's dealing with in the post fight <laughs> with Brett Akamoto on ESPN. Yeah, no, I'm saying that like they know he's 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 down to fight and he, yeah. he's not messing. He's around. been down since Kimbo days, right, man. Right. Bare yeah. knuckle Braun. Dude, for him as well. That okay. What did you think about the actual fight though? So the actual fight. This is how I see it. The way I see it is Darren Till is bigger. Darren Till is being assertive and aggressive and head hunting a little bit. Honestly, I don't know if he had anything that you would call a tactical misstep. At the end of the in-cage post-fight interview, Jorge mentions their age. Jorge's 34. He's an absolute veteran. Till is 24. He's a veteran in his own right. Mm -hmm. He's got a pretty deep record. He's not like 4-0 like Crone was getting into the UFC. So he's got some fights underneath him. But you know what? At these higher levels, you're going to get tested. So what I saw was there were a lot of switch ups. I saw Masvidal threaten the takedowns a little bit. So maybe a Muay Thai fight till takes it with that pressure and power. No, but in MMA, mm -hmm. Masvidal switching it up with the threat of a takedown and he has submitted people in the past. He has taken people down. Darren did just lose by, by submission mm -hmm. when he was on the ground. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's a legitimate enough fear that allowed him to get his right cross, which was a feint, and Darren bit on it, hit him with one hook. That, in my opinion, knocked him out. Yeah, he was As out. he was falling, he, was he got a second hook. That and then the, when he hit the ground, got he one. got a third hook yeah. before the ref pulled him back. I think, it was a, I think it was a hammer, but yeah, I agree. I mean, it was all the left hand. Right. It was three left hands. Yeah, exactly. Of different kind. Very a different. three piece without the soda like he <laughs> no gave to soda, Leon. No and we'll, soda. Get, we'll get to that too. Uh, but, but I want to say a point that I tweeted. Mm -hmm. This is interesting. Okay. We have two Anglo fighters who lost to two Hispanic fighters who delved deep into nature. Diego Sanchez and Jorge Masvidal. Okay. Both of these people are the older veterans and the other ones up and coming. And a lot of people make the argument that these veterans are being fed to create new rising stars. stars yeah. I think you can't feed people in an authentic sport like MMA because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, the veterans got fed. So Diego Sanchez into a lot of different things about nature that we've talked about and other people have talked about elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Jorge spent his time 
in this survivor-like series, deeply getting to know himself. With Yoel. With, with, I think Yoel's after. Oh, but yeah, no, no, no. yeah, I think Yoel got after him. I think he recommended Yoel. So Jorge got no phone, no internet, no distractions. He talked about a lot of things people were talking about, cutting people out of his life that he thought were negative. He didn't want to mention the specifics, but in the post fight with Brett Akamoto outside the cage, he said that he had a lot of personal demons he's been dealing with, yeah. but overall he's in a better situation in his life. So for me, the fact that both of these men who are veterans delved deep into nature, delved deep into themselves, it seems like they got kind of a, a new a new lease on their MMA careers. He needed it because he was coming off a couple of losses and a long break. He was like a year out from the sport, and when he was last in the sport, he had a couple of losses. Yeah, to but Wonder Boy and to tough guys. It yeah, wasn't like easy fights. Top level. And th this is a hard fight for Jorge. Jorge has more fights at lightweight than he has at welterweight. That, Jorge, that makes a weight cutting a de uh, decision and debate, maybe, but right? Maybe lost Masvidal. That's has, interesting. Has a loss. I didn't know that. That's the same thing with Diego. Yeah. they were both at fifty five, right? Yeah, but Jorge has a loss to Al. Ali Quinta. Quinta at 55? At 55. Ali Quinta ain't no joke. Right, but maybe he was cutting too much for the 155 division and he probably shouldn't have been cutting And Al's much. no joke. And, and Masvidal uh, has a win over Cerrone at 55. There's a bunch of fights at the end at 55. And I think that th this was a fight that I was scared that, you know, D Darren was going to hurt him bad. And I think that's what Darren needed to do. Like, KO first round type said, situation? You said that in a Muay Thai fight, Darren could win. I maybe I said. I don't think I don't so. know. I think... Jorge Masvidal has some of the maybe he has a better team. chance. Is Listen, what I'm trying I to say. Think, I think Masvidal has the, way more tools than Darren does in, in pure striking. striking. Striking, interesting, as, everywhere, way more tools. But Darren has that explosive KO power early. Yeah, and it almost worked. He put him down in the first like oh thirty my. seconds, and so, it was like. I don't know if he said "wow" in Spanish or if he said "wow," but you can see if you go back at the footage that when Darren Till does that first knockdown, like. Like after the Liu Kang kick breakup <laughs> by the ref, they get back. And the first thing is Till knocks him down. Jorge falls down and audibly says, wow or wow. Yeah, Spanish. he felt it. He was like, like really. I don't think Jorge had been hit in a cage that hard before. Like he was just like, oh man, it was a big yeah. dude. He said in the post fight interview, I felt in that moment I wanted to kill him. And he said, if I let up, if he lets me get back up, I'm going to get him. <laughs> that's because he's a killer. Like Jorge is crazy, bro. But what I'm saying is, I was nervous and I thought that that was how it was going to go. I thought Darren was going to finish him that way and that's how he needed to do it. He on needed, the ground or on the feet? He needed to just get one hit, put him down, hammer fist, finish, get out of there early. Because if he let it be a long fight, slowly Masvidal was going to pick him apart. What would you think of that getup? What would you think of his guard and how he got back up? I think it's just that the till is not that experienced with finishing a guy on the ground. He probably could have if he would have had more skills down there. I don't want to hate too much until I think he's great. I think he's a fantastic fighter. Maybe too much too early with Woodley and Masvidal. I think what they were trying to get him Masvidal fight because no one else would come and it would be a fight to get him back on a winning track. I thought that was a terrible choice to match If they wanted that, if the UFC's goal was to get Till back on the right track, put him back in the title contention immediately, and give him a guy like Masvidal, who is going to be hungry coming back off of losses, like it's a tough fight. And it worked, man. And I think, And you can't even say, honestly, that Masvidal, like, pieced him up and like like slowly picked him apart. I thought it could have gone either way. It was a 50-50 situation and he got lucky and the hook landed. He like he bit on the feint first. He bit on the feint and the hook hard landed. on the feint. He had he put two hands up to block the right hand. Yeah. And then the left caught him here once, twice, third time on yeah. the ground. And and you know props to Jorge because he doesn't throw hooks that much. He didn't throw a hook in that fight really. Yeah. And he's not known for power hooks. He's known for the yeah. you know the jabs, the just the cross keeping it simple, lots of leg kicks. He doesn't throw a lot of power He says power that's shots. the first time he ever threw it. So they were both southpaw. The commentators were saying earlier in the night that there were about four or five matches that were orthodox for southpaw, orthodox for southpaw. This match was southpaw versus southpaw. And Jorge said he has never thrown a left hook from southpaw before against a southpaw. Mm -hmm. And and you know what? Maybe Darren Till knew that. Maybe Darren Till knows that it wasn't coming, and he's like, that, "That's not a punch that's gonna be thrown." And it completely took him by surprise. And it was like it could have been lucky, but still, it, it, it's a little bit of pretense of knowledge, a little bit of arrogance in an, a situation of uncertainty. Yeah, and um, to quote Hayek and Nassim, since we mentioned him <laughs> earlier.
I think we're going to just try to build up as many uh, references as we can. 100%. We've got to give people bibliographies. Absolutely. We're well versed here. Little Easter eggs. Um, I think that Masvidal probably er earned himself into contention. With so I was just going to ask you that. Who do you want next for Till? Who do you want next for Masvidal? It's so tough, especially because Masvidal basically set in stone what his next fight is going to be with that post-fight antics with Leon Edwards. I mean... Yeah. Like Aspen, Aspen accused him of doing that on purpose to avoid fighting him. Listen, Aspen's going to say whatever he wants. Aspen, does, we will use any opportunity to get a jive in. I don't think yeah. he actually believes that. I don't know. Because Jorge's the type of guy where if you see him on the street, if you said the same shit, if you tried to call him out on the street, that's exactly what would happen to you. He's, he's like, he forgets, I think, yeah. that he's in a work setting. Like, you know what I mean? Like, he's like, he's ready to go whenever, wherever, let's go. Like, I'm down. I, I, I don't know if he forgets or he doesn't give a fuck. That, it's one of the two. <laughs> <laughs> one of the Fs. Because I think Leon is like, you know, the whole it's business style of like trying to promote a fight, trying to be like, hey, call out somebody and be like, yeah. let's go, it's business. He's not actually looking to fight in that scenario. I saw some commentators say basically to that effect that his personality in real life doesn't match the persona he was trying to display. So he's more reserved, more quiet, more shy. He's trying to promote he's a fight. Soft spoken, promote but a fight. he and he might not even like promoting fights that way. Mm -hmm. But he might think in this post Conor McGregor era, yeah. this is the only way. In this right. Colby Covington era, even though he didn't get his last please situation. Please don't give Colby an era. <laughs> I don't think he quite deserves his own era. Yeah. Well, he got it. all those fights that he got, and he did get his interim belt at his time that he did take to President oh, Donald Trump. It, it irks me to have a Colby Covington era. But, <laughs> hey, but, man, you need a heel. It's true. It's total pro wrestling stuff now. <laughs> UFC is total pro wrestling stuff. Yeah, I grew up on WWE. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think that the Leon Edwards fight is you practically have to make it after that. Shenanigan. Although I would have preferred a lot of other fights for uh, Jorge. I mean, I know uh, Usman's manager Ali was trying to make that Masvidal fight happen already. I just don't think that's the right fight to do. I think so many other people, like you said, Colby probably deserves that fight, or give Ben Askren or somebody that fight. But I think Masvidal versus Santiago would have been a great fight. Ponzinibbio. Yeah, because. Dos Anjos doesn't want to fight Ponzi You mean, would it have been prior to this? Or no, 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 no. No, that'd be an interesting fight. So you wouldn't give Leon him? Oh, Leon versus Ponzi That could be fun, too. But I think Leon really um, deserves... I don't actually... You know what? Now that I think about it, Santiago's, like, went top five already in the welterweight. So that's already... Is he? Yeah. I thought, okay, I thought he was... Yeah, little... so that, that would actually be a good, a good... Either person fighting Santiago makes sense. You know, like, Leon fighting him or Jorge fighting him. Um... You could do that, or you could do Jorge Masvidal versus Robbie Lawler. That'd be a fucking scrap. Absolute scrap, but it would be no title picture. In no, it'd be a nothing fight. Yeah. Where, they, they, neither one gain anything. You know, it's two veterans going at it. Neither one. It's just a they get higher in the top ten. Yeah, that's true. They're beating a ranked opponent, which is always good. Another good fight. I mean, if he doesn't want Puns and who's another big monster at one seventy, is a smaller guy who's also fought at lightweight. Is that's Dos Anjos. I think Dos Anjos and Masvidal would be a good fight. It would be yeah. interesting. A lot of interesting, high-level shit. Really high-level all around. Tyron Woodley needs to earn his keep in Dana's white, Ooh, Dana White's man, eyes. So man. Tyron Woodley, Jorge Masvidal would be interesting. Would be great, but I think that's an easy fight for Tyron. That'd be like a little bit of a... Uh, he's going to Usman. You sound like you're underrating the man you say people underrated. Listen, Darren Till's wrestling versus Woodley's wrestling is <laughs> a completely different thing. Um, but for in terms of Darren Till, I think I talked to you about this prior, and that's I think he's done at 170. I think he's too big of a star. I don't know if you noticed the reaction the fans had when he came out. He was like a, like a, one of the biggest things that's ever been in the London card, in the UFC. And I think it's too early to bring him down and put him, like, he's going to have to fight somebody, like, barely in the rankings now, coming off two losses. He can't even get a huge fight going. He's going to be on the main card, maybe not on the headliner. You could probably still get him to headline an event if you move him up to 185. Give him somebody, one of the big names at 185, and see if he can make it in that division. I think that would be fun. I think that would be a crowd pleaser. And I think he could do it. He's pretty big. I, I would love that. I'm going to do you one better on your principal. And I bet he was walking around at 200, 200 plus. i like to see him fight at light heavyweight. I know you would. Against Elir Latifi. Because as we, say here, out. as we say here, open weight is the only way. Is the only <laughs> way. Elir Latifi versus Darren Till. What do you think about that fight? 
That's a bad fight for Darren Till. Why? Because Darren Till will just get taken down and will go for many rides. He's going to go for a <laughs> lot of rides. He might as well pay for a ticket. All the roller coasters. Exactly. He's going to throw them around. I like it. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. I think that would not be fun for him. But if he gets like a striker, like, I don't even know, like, what, what a high level, you know. Johnny Walker versus Darren Till. A 205? Or Dominic Reyes oh, versus Darren he, Till. No, but then these guys, then Till looks small. I don't think they're that different if you let him bulk. I think he looks emaciated because he's the, cutting. The reach, though. Darren's got, like, max. You're right. The reach would be lower. Yeah, he'd, he'd be the smaller guy. He'd For sure, he'd be way smaller. I don't think, he because he'd be bulkier. It'd be different. It's I a think, different build. I think Shorter, like, stockier. With everyone cutting the way they do, I think he would still be successful at middleweight. Whereas light heavyweight would be a stretch. He How about one of the two middleweights who say they're going to move to light heavyweight? So, for example, Chris Weidman or Luke Rockhold versus him at light heavy. I'd be more interested in the Rockhold fight, I think. At oh, light heavy. At light heavy. Uh, I'd be more interested in the Rockhold fight because I think Weidman um, would be a little tough for uh, Darren Till. I, that's not to say Weidman is better than Rockhold by any means. We still haven't seen that. But stylistically. Fight. But stylistically, I don't like Weidman. You think his wrestling and his BJJ would overwhelm Yeah, I just, Till, I just think it would. Whereas Rockhold might want to trade with him. Yeah, Rockhold has a tendency to not use wrestling, even though he's good at it. Yeah, he's he defensively it. like Robert yeah, Whitaker. He, he could be. He was a brown belt in jiu-jitsu yeah, right. and a wrestling champion in Australia. But mostly uses just, just escape, 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 kickbox you, escape, escape, kickbox you. Right, right. Yeah, no, I agree. I think so for sure. Um, and then I think that that covers the card. Unless you want to talk briefly about the fiasco outside of the arena, we kind of discussed we, we that a little bit by touching. It. I think that Leon was trying to promote the fight. You know, like possibly get a, a cool Mazdal fight because he said he wanted the winner of Mazdal yep. Till, and he, I'm sure he wanted Till in his eyes, but. He's not going to get it. And then um, Masvidal just didn't take kindly to it. You know, it was one of those situations where he was being real. And Leon was just like, I wasn't ready for this to be a real thing, but okay. And I don't think there should be any re repercussions. Like, come He's on. not pressing charges. He already He's not, said. No, but I'm saying from the UFC, that. there shouldn't be any stripping from the commissions or Reno no. money or anything like yeah. that. Like, Masvidal needs to put his kid in college and... Don't take any more. That was hilarious. Yeah, come He on. was thirsty for that. That fight. He, that he kept was... saying it. I'm like, come on, man. He's like yeah. the main event of the card. He, he told everybody. He went up to the judges, to the refs. He's like, thought I was fighting the night. <laughs> My God. Yeah. Um, hey, man. He was shooting his shot for real. Yeah. I think that's good for MMA. Are there any other combat sports like well, no. grappling or striking that you wanted to get into? If you wanted to keep talking about like decisions and stuff and how you know, are they draws or are they, you know, are they actual finishes to a fight? I want to ask you this question about... Um, Errol Spence versus Mickey Garcia. That was the big so boxing, yeah, welterweight title that was on the line. Yeah, um, and their weights are a little different in boxing than UFC. Right, it's not welterweight in one seventy. They, yeah. It's much lower actually, um, and that finished in the decision for Spence beating um, Mickey. And Mickey was coming up two weight classes. He wasn't coming up one. He wasn't going from lightweight to super lightweight. He was going from lightweight to welterweight, which is two jumps. Yeah, and Errol Spence is a much taller guy, much bigger guy, and I thought, to be honest, that Mickey was the more technical boxer, and I thought that he might be able to get, you know, like just on the inside and just avoid the long reach of Errol Spence and just like work him, work the body, work you know, get get really in there, and then but Errol showed real skill on the stuff I watched, and he really, really looked good and looked far better than I expected him. And maybe I haven't seen enough of Errol's fights. Like, I knew his record was phenomenal, but he looked really good and looked dominant, and maybe it is because of the size. Maybe it wasn't, but I don't know. So, I think repetition is great as a form of emphasis. So, if you feel like I'm repeating, that's because I'm repeating. <laughs> Open weight is the only weight. Yeah. So, Conor McGregor looked... Phenomenal at 145 pounds. Mm -hmm. He did well against one opponent at 155, mm -hmm. and then he's had a shaky record since he went up to 170, and now he's talking crazy about 185. Yeah, I think that the higher weight class you go in, the more excellency or excellence is exposed. Whether or not someone is technical, in my opinion, is exposed 
by the higher and higher weight classes you see them in. Conor McGregor, if he had continued the rest of his career at 145, might have been one of the greatest 145ers of all time. One blessed Max Holloway might have something else to say about that. Yeah. Jose Aldo might have something to say about it. Mm -hmm. Zabit and Crone coming up and Brian Ortega. <laughs> I might love have that you to throw a 5 and 0 fighter in that mix. They might have something to say about it. They might have something to say about it, especially mm -hmm. with the, the Nate Diaz cornering him and, and that whole issue. Okay. They might have something to say about that. But what I saw from that is that the higher weight class he got, the more we saw that, oh, maybe it wasn't he was so excellent, but that he was well matched up for this particular group of people who wouldn't do as well in higher ones. Mm -hmm. Another example I give you recently from Bellator is Rory McDonald versus Musasi. Mm -hmm. Rory McDonald is coached by my favorite coach in the game, right? That TriStar, that Dana Hare lineage yeah. for Hasa Habi. He's trained also by George St. Pierre, an arguable greatest of all time. But Musasi out classed him. But here's and the you thing. can't say it wasn't technical. No, but here's so the thing. So for your boxing question here, mm -hmm. I, I think Mickey was exposed. But listen, okay. Here's my thinking here. The I actually think the Rory Musasi fight was an outlier. Because if you've noticed something, the the lighter weights that have come up to the heavier weight in those super fights that have been going around these days have won the fight more often than not. Sahudo. Oh no, Dale Shawkin. Yeah, that's the other way. Smaller guy. That's the other way. That's a DC example. beating Stipe. Um, but it's still a smaller guy winning, is what I'm saying. So D DC beating Stipe. Um, DC's not smaller than him. He weighs more than him. Okay, but a 205 is coming than up to. But you can't say 205 is disingenuous. It's not, that. because a 6'4 guy, Stipe, is bigger than a 5'11 DC. Okay, but reach Taller. everything. Who's bigger, Darren Wynn or Luke Rockhold? Luke Rockhold. Okay, I would say Darren Wynn because he weighs more. No, Luke Rockhold is, is going to be the bigger guy than Darren Wynn. Darren Wynn is they train almost together. a foot shorter. Yeah, that's what I'm but saying. But he weighs more. DC, you're right, is significantly shorter than Stipe. And, and the I reach, have to check the reach shorter. The leg But he outweighs hard. Stipe by about 10 to 15 pounds. pounds. It's not, it's not, that's, that's okay. He's coming from a guy, a guy, Stipe could not make 205. That's the bottom line. I don't know. Where DC, DC can't. I don't know that. Um, but what I'm, I'm saying is. to DC does. Right. Uh, well, that's because he's starting. You know, it's a whole different thing. But I Wrestling just think that I just think that the Rory fight, if everything went by the playbook, he would have won that fight because theoretically he would be cutting less. You know, that's the whole argument of cutting less means you're going to perform better. Yeah. But it could just be that Musasi was just like it's just an amazing fighter and probably one of the best middleweights. Correct. You know, that's a different thing. But I wanted to ask you this thing. I don't know, before we go back to the boxing because it kind of ties into this because you made some. I find to be outlandish statements, but I I, let I it, live in that land. I love I love that you do. I appreciate that. So, do you think, for example, that uh, Stipe Miocic, just throwing him out there because he's the so-called heavyweight goat, is a more skilled fighter technically than T.J. Dillashaw? Hundred percent. Oh man, hundred percent. That for me is a big no. Put me on a record for an. Oh, 100%. I've told you this before. When we used to play the Champions of North and Champions of North Return to Arms, we'd have these big boss battles. And a lot of Dungeons and Dragons type or fantasy type games have this. And bigger foes, right? There's the American saying, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. You can find ways to dance around them. I, I am guessing that Stipe is more technical because... We don't have an absolute division right now. What I am saying to you is I would like to see an absolute match. Open weight. TJ Dillashaw has said that he walks around at 165. So right now he fought at 125. To me, the fact that he cut to 125 means nothing. He weighs in the ring anywhere, anywhere between no, no, anywhere between 150 and 165. When he's fighting Bantam, when he's, he's flying. No, both. No. That's the crazy thing. Listen to his podcast. That much. I heard, listen, I listened to his podcast. He has a very scientific crew with, I always butcher the guy's name, Sam Calavita, Calavita and The Garage with Aaron Pico and with Cub Swanson and all the boys in Orange County. But he said he cut, he got back to the same weight as when he was Bantam. And it's always between 150 and 165. Okay. Okay. 
And when he's not weight cutting at all, it's gonna be closer to that 165. And maybe if he's bulking, maybe he's 170. Anyway, I don't know what his end weight is. But why does that make you think Stipe is more technical? Let me tell you why. Just because of his size? No, no. I say I don't know. I said my guess is Stipe, but I don't know. What I would like to see is an absolute division in the UFC. If not the whole thing, be absolute. Have an absolute division and maybe- Have it open to anybody? Maybe just begin with open to champions. So Dillashaw was a champion, Stipe was a champion. Allow them in between their championship defenses to fight each other open weight. So my guess is TJ would be between 165 and 170 and he'd be the healthiest that he's ever been because he's only focusing on technique and strategy as opposed to weight. And then I would like to see what happens. My initial gut guess, and I could be totally wrong, and I'm willing to be disproved, I would love it if I was disproved, is Dillashaw versus Stipe, Stipe would win. If Dillashaw won but that- that wasn't my question. Holy shit. My question is not holy who would shit. win. But my question was But that's who what win. I mean by technical. Okay, but For me, the one who's more technical is the one whose strategy wins. Mm. You said that to me earlier when we were discussing Leon Edwards versus Gunnar Nelson. No, that's you game just, plan. Game plan is different than technical. Game plan is idea based. Technical is your skills. Like when I told you Jorge Masvidal has more tools in his locker than Darren Till, that's what I mean by technical. He has more options, more things he can do inside of the cage. I understand your distinction. And let me tell you where the rubber meets the road in my disagreement. I'll give a basketball analogy since we like basketball and Ariel Hawani has been dipping into basketball commentary. He actually missed UFC London for that that reason. I saw that. Someone could be great at hitting three point shots Mm -hmm. in practice. Mm -hmm. But for me, like Iverson, I say, we talking about practice? I want to see, can they shoot a three with a man in their face with the arena screaming? So for me, a man of their own size. No, (laughs) no, that's a, for me, that's an artificial stipulation. So for me, can TJ Dillashaw hit a more technical punch combo on the mitts than Stipe? Probably. Yeah. I don't know 100%. Stipe is pretty technical too. If you want to say that. As a boxer, he is. As a boxer. Not as a kick. On the mitts. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. His wrestling and boxing are great. So transferring from mitts, how about a dummy? Okay. Maybe Dillashaw's still better. Okay, dummy, get rid of a dummy. How about a random citizen off the street? Okay, as we progress through the levels, we go through how can he do it against the best fighters on earth? And the only way to resolve that is with an absolute division. I don't know the answer. I would like to see it. Can I I give my opinion real quick? Holla at me. You already called it an abomination. I think I I did. And I keep that on record. (laughs) I think Jose Aldo at 205 pounds, is the greatest fighter in the history of the world. Possible. I think Jose Aldo... You think two, that's how much he weighs? It'll be two of them in there. You think that's how much Jose he weighs? Aldo's, no, uh, Jose Aldo weighs like 160 pounds. Do you think he but tops also, out at 160? Yeah, something around 160, 170. I think Jose Aldo bulked up at five foot seven, 200 pounds, yeah. is the best fighter. Maurice Jones drew build. I think he's the best fighter in the entire world, if he wants to be. He'll be fat. He'll be tubby out, though. I what love he'll be. it, man. He'll be shaking his I like big country. Yeah. I like the black beast. No, man. But that's the thing, though. I don't think that you have to be... See, it's the whole, like, dealing with absolutes thing. Like, I know an absolute division is fun, and you could... It's your choice to fun. like that. But I think that you can have both. You can have divisions. I don't think divisions are a bad thing. I think that you can... If someone wants to go for it, sure. But I think, like... I would like to see guys of similar stature fighting each other. I don't think it's yeah, bad. I don't, let me rephrase. I do think divisions are inferior. I'm fine with them in the squo or the status quo. But what I'm saying is alongside the weight divisions have an absolute. Mm-hmm. That's not mutually exclusive. You can have people fight people their size. The ideology, the ideology the cream is, of the is crop mutually is exclusive. Absolute. The ideology is mutually exclusive. Not the second because one. Because you're, you're believing in that the baddest person on the planet is the only the person that only wins that absolute division. That's, That's what people say it. about the heavyweight champion right now. Right. They call him the baddest man, and when they joke about DC, the daddest man. I think I think Jose Aldo at 200 pounds destroys DC. I'd like to see it. I'm just saying. I'd I'm like saying, to see it. It's such a theoretical with Jose Aldo would I'd never like get up to 200 pounds. I'd but like I'm saying, it. I'd like to see it. Technicality wise. Max Holloway has called out on camera DC. I think Max beats DC too. 
I'd like to see. <laughs> I think Max gets up to 180. I think Max gets if up you to 25. <laughs> I'm saying forget 180. Man, <laughs> honestly, I think any most people 170 and above are probably 200 pounders. Easy. So in my opinion, Easy. in like the first UFCs, they'd be I'd 200 be plus pounds. I'd be if there's welterweights out there that don't walk around at 190 to 200. I'd be shocked. Well, the, the two that we just named earlier who got into nature, Diego Sanchez and Jorge Masvidal, because I think, they fought at lower. I think Diego and Jorge probably walk around close to 190 as well. Because oh, you're you go, saying close to 200, not yeah. quite. No, but I'm past, saying not, you're not saying past it. A lot of them are at 200, like Derrick Rose over yes. 200, whereas Nicky Gall, right? Um, I think because like if you look at the 155ers, like Nate and Donald, when they were like teasing a fight, they're like, "Fuck it, let's do it at 185," because that's what they walk around at. You know what yeah. I mean? That so my thinking is the 55ers, a lot of them are walking at 185. Then obviously 170 is going to be walking around 200. It's just a crazy game, the whole weight cutting game. Um, but back to Errol Spence and uh, Mickey Garcia, I think it was an enlightening fight and it really showed to me that Errol Spence is like the real, real deal. And I think you have to see a Crawford fight now for the undisputed of that division. Terrence Crawford and him have to throw down at some point. There's a lot of like promotional fighting because like one is signed to one promotion, the other is yeah. the other. It's hard to get those fights to happen. That's a common theme with a lot of That's stuff we're going to be talking about. But we still have to respect that the boxing promotions do interpromotional fights. And unify. They unify. Yes. They allow it Which to happen. Which we haven't seen in MMA yet. Right. I would love that. Oh so my God. We, have, that's we, have, one we thing haven't I talked about this about yet. Boxing. But having like a, a full on, not, not, not just like a divisional tournament, not like a, like a, uh, Heavyweight tournament like a UFC, Bellator, Ryzen. Ryzen and one, one are talking about it right no, now. No, but I'm like, put all of them in oh brackets my God. and have oh them all God. throw that would be the greatest. You want a Royal Rumble, dog. That's what you want. <laughs> Not in the same ring at the same time. <laughs> I'm saying brackets, have them all fight each uh, other, and have all the champions fight each other. That'd be great. But what I'm saying. I'm, I'm sure Bader wants that. Oh, it would be fantastic. Double champ versus double champ. Oh, it would be fantastic. Um, but. I think for Errol Spence, either it's gotta be the Terrence Crawford fight. I know they're trying to book that Manny Pacquiao fight with him next, and Manny's he's old, and I, I just I think that's bad for Manny. Like, why would you do that? Uh, he wants it. Give it to him, bro. Let's see it. It goes back to the debate that we are having: veteran versus up and comer. Yeah. Who's gonna get it? Yeah. And I think it's up in the air. I think Errol. I, I don't think you could write out Spence. Manny Pacquiao. Put me down for Errol Spence in Vegas. Um, I I agree. I love Manny too. Manny's I agree. great. Um, but and then for. Mickey Garcia, I think it was a win-win fight for him because if he wins, he starts achieving that like pound-for-pound pound best status because he jumped up two weight classes and grabbed a belt against a really tough guy. And then if he loses, it's like, oh, he jumped up two weight classes. You know, like there's a reason why he didn't get it. So it was like, you know, he was just going for an opportunity there. And I think there's still a lot of great fights for him down at lightweight. And I think he goes down... And if Lomachenko wins his next fight, I would love if they managed to come to an agreement and have Mickey Garcia versus Lomachenko. You know how much I love Lomachenko. I, like I try to talk too. about Lomachenko as much as I can. I like him. The man. Matrix, man. He's the a man Thaddeus Russell put me on to him. And I, I wasn't always the biggest boxing fan because We're, we, we I, like, grappling here. I like <laughs> less and less rules. Mm -hmm. Boxing is very restricted. Very. But very most restricted, restricted. fighting sports. You, there you is. can't do a spinning back fist even. Right, you, you know can't do I mean? anything like that. You yeah. can't even throw an elbow. The gloves are even bigger, which in my opinion are more unrealistic. Although adding restrictions, but it's still not adding restrictions allows fighters to tone up on the specific skills. Though I have to say that I, I know I that would, it makes it less realistic. I would, fight, yes, but you do tone up those skills that exist. You know what I agreed, mean? Agreed. Agreed. If you off all you had to do. Is like like look at the cross the, jab hook uppercut you know like look at the dunk contest people yeah like all the different dunk contest specialists on YouTube now like all they have to do is dunk they get better than the people in the NBA right you know what I'm saying it's there, not in game there's that one dude I'm forgetting his name right now but he came out in jeans at the last dunk contest. <laughs> that's crazy man you know what I'm saying so yeah. I agree with you yeah. but I agree with Faraz's analysis that the the more restrictive the more rules there are the more you're relying on genetics and just what someone's born with right and the Versus less technique. less creativity creativity less less options less technique overall sure. i i can i can i can see your point there um but hey genetics is interesting too of course of course um, and then other than Errol Spence and Mick Garcia, what else was happening? A lot was happening this week. Tension. Did you oh, want to wow. talk about that our, was last our week. but our Twitter background? 
Oh man, oh yeah, by the way. White belt, white belt, white belt MMA, MMA S. Or Soma, we still don't know, but White Belt MMA S, um, Martial Arts and Sciences. We put tension up there as our background photo, that latest uh, cartwheel kick KO, man. That thing is so exciting. The I, man who may or may have not had a fake or real exhibition was Floyd Mayweather. <laughs> that was a work. We know it was a work. That was a setup. We know Floyd made money off that. We know that. And he probably paid a little bit of tension to make that yeah. happen. But is it Josh Barnett's blood sport? Is it the WWE? Is it MMA? Who knows? Who what knows? It? But what you people need to do is watch all of Tension's KOs because that dude is so exciting. He finds crazy ways to finish fights and it's just amazing. And there he had an event. A lot, I think it was last weekend. We we talked about it on the last podcast, but we had some glitch. It went into the ether. We lost it forever. We briefly wanted to touch it. Um Tension had a fight with one promotion. I think it's called uh, um, Rise. I think it was the Rise kickboxing promotion in Japan. And he won his fight. And then there was another kickboxing event, K1 um, event. And there was Takaru, who's like another guy in the same division as Tension, another relatively young guy who's a killer, monster streak. Both of them are knockout artist guys. And I just see them as two people running up on opposite sides of the hill, and they're gonna meet at the top eventually. If Japan can stop playing around and get the promotional thing right, because we <laughs> talked about this with the boxing, about how we want these guys to fight each other, we uh, just got to make it happen. So we will definitely be the first ones on top of the Takaru tension fight if it ever happens, but hoping, hoping it will happen. I'm going I'm to hit you with an obscure one. Just because I brought up Josh Barnett, I forgot about this, but I actually saw one of his grapplers, Victor Henry, at a local grappling tournament last year that I was uh, grappling at, it was jujitsu. He was the super fight, right? And uh, he, he actually—I think he's an MMA fighter too. He though. is. Yeah. So he lost that super fight that I actually saw in jujitsu, but it was—it was good. It was a good match. But recently, he just fought in an organization called Deep in MMA. That's Japan, right? Yeah, and he won by it was—it was a good kind of striking battle at first, but eventually he got him to the ground. And he got him to a choke that I was just working on this past Friday in jiu-jitsu class, and I didn't know the name of it. So I actually asked Josh Barnett, and he, he responded on, on Instagram saying that he calls it the head and compression, uh, the head and arm compression. I haven't heard that. Has that been called something else? It, 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 it probably has a more technical name. I'd have to look up the kind of judo books to see what the Japanese say oh, it's about an older it. older move, huh? Yeah, yeah the, the Japanese uses it in judo, um, but you basically... It's like an arm triangle, except you're up in cross side. So you have their arm, you have their their head, and you're just choking them while putting your body weight on them. And he finished oh, them that okay. way. Okay. Dean Lister was finished by Josh Barnett. Really? In this, in a in a grappling by that tournament, move? by that move wow. a long time ago. So his his disciple Victor wow. Henry just finished a guy with that. And what's interesting about it is, you know, we could talk about different groups like. Catch wrestling. Can I just say that I love fighting, everyone a non-Japanese fighter fighting in Japanese promotions and he's oh, not yeah. a big name. I love. Oh him. yeah, I love when guys. Well, Barnett go, is a Japanophile, so that yeah, makes sense. I love when guys go out there and say, "Fuck it, I'm going to go to some crazy promotion in a different country." Hey, Amen. If down. Saitama ever calls my name, you'll I'm be going to that super crazy. arena. <laughs> hey, I know you. You'll I'm fight in the sumo. You'll I'll fight sumo, sumo yeah. bare knuckle boxing, <laughs> bare a left way, MMA. I'll, I'll fight uh, thumb war. Anything. I'll do a thumb war, baby. Anything. <laughs> I'm wrestling. Come on, dog. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, it was a lot of events, though. So, so yeah. So, just you know, while we're on the subject of grappling, anything you want to say about Polaris Nine? Oh, dude, that was also this weekend. You're right. Um, that was the one with Rafael Lovato and Jake Shields. Two right? MMA fighters, as we said, yes. going out of Although, their most recent okay, Jake comfort zones Jake into Shields, grappling. Jake Shields you can classify as a MMA fighter, more so as a grappler. I think Lovato, with this level of accomplishments in the grappling scene, versus his 9-0 record in Bellator, I think you could classify well, him. He would offer the title shot against Mushasi, sure. who we were just talking about, and he had to pull out. He's already decorated as an MMA fighter. What I'm saying is yeah. he's more decorated. As a, known as a jujitsu guy, you know. Agreed. Yeah. But I would go back and say his his decoration and even his principles and philosophy. Like I've heard, he forces Justin Wren, the heavyweight that works with the Pygmies, mm -hmm. to still train in the gi, even though they're both MMA fighters. Whereas Jake Shields has been on that no gi tip with Dana Hare and the Death Squad recently. Yeah. But you know, when I was watching Polaris Nine, I was really hyped for that fight, and that was actually of all the fights that night, that was the one that disappointed the most. 
Yeah, what can you do? Like, it was it was a kind of like, I don't know if Jake didn't have an idea for how he wanted to finish Raphael. Like, he kind of would get into a couple of nice positions. He was, like, on top for a couple moments where he got a takedown, and he was, like, sitting in, in, in uh, Raphael's guard, and he just didn't know what to do. He was, like, sitting there being careful. I guess he was nervous of, like, Raphael's going to take one of his arms or, take you know, take something in that situation. But... It was a lot of stalling. There was a moment where I even thought the ref could even bring them up. And you know, I hate when the ref brings people up in jiu-jitsu. Oh, it's you know, the worst. You know, it's like, but I'm like, it, this could use it. Because we're sitting there watching five minutes of Jake stalling, you know. But, you know, I think refs have a propensity of being afraid when it's big, high-level names to, like, make a move. To make yeah. them move. Because it's like, you didn't just make Rafael Mato get up. Did you? Like, why did you do that? But, so I think it could have used that. It was a, not that interesting of a fight. I think Lovato won by decision, which I would agree with. Jake didn't really offer much. So Lovato has a Jeet Kune Do background, actually. His father was Jeet Kune Do before they did BJJ. But Jake's is wrestling background. Right. Did you I mean, notice anything different in the, in the, in the stand-up grappling versus the ground grappling? No, it was a lot of, um, it was a lot of just like, very normal jujitsu stuff. It wasn't anything like using wrestling for double leg takedowns or something like there wasn't a lot of that in there. There was a lot of uh neckties and stuff for okay. kind of nothing and pull downs I forget terminologies but uh, head and collar. Collar choke. You know collar and other it just wasn't anything that was like specific to wrestling. Okay. Know? Um but I thought you know Lovato won the fight but it wasn't that interesting. There was um a few interesting People on that card too. A couple of people we talked about on the ABCC episode. That we Wagner played. Hocha. Wagner Hocha. The, okay. the man who TKO'd somebody in CJG. I'll forever remember him that way. Yes. What did he do this time? Uh, he won his fight against Ross Nichols, who I actually had as my dark horse for ABCC. Yeah. I loved his guard work. I love how he is on the bottom, but Wagner was just not having any of it. He was always going for passing. Very aggressive. Hitting Ross a couple times in the face, I think on uh, accident. I don't know if he was like forgetting the CJJ rule set, but I think Wagner is just like <laughs> one of the most aggressive jujitsu. Super guys. aggressive. I think, let's call it what it is. I think he's dirty. I think he's yeah. like uh, he's not. Oh boy, who's the four on the Warriors? Oh, Draymond Green. That's Draymond a, Green. A, another reference. I thought you were gonna say Husamar Polaris, the guy that. Uh, oh, that that <laughs> dude is that dude is dirty beyond the limit and has actually been disqualified right. for holding I thought you were going to go there, long. but you went Draymond Green. I think Wagner Hocha doesn't do anything that would get him disqualified or kicked out, but he dances on the gray areas yeah. all the time. Yeah, he uses Like, that. where someone would try to pass your guard by lifting you, I think he'd rub his knuckles into you, he'd, mm -hmm. rub, he'd rub his palm into you, you know, you every could, little you thing he could do. You could see Ross's face getting red from certain smacks, but yeah. like... Ross wasn't going to say anything, and he didn't, you know, it was fine. It wasn't anything too bad. I wouldn't have disqualified Wagner for anything, but he was super aggressive, went for it every time, agreed. and got the decision, and, you know, rightfully so. I agreed with that. Do you think you're biased in your dark horse selection because his name sounds like yours, and you've been called Ross before? No, I think I just, I think he's got fantastic leg work. I think nowadays, now that everyone's up on the leg locks, like, I think that the fad has reached a point where I'm like not as interested to see leg lockers and Ross Nichols has a lot of great leg entanglements that like he, he does a lot of interesting work when he's down there so I'm like love looking at the technique but yeah. at the same time I'm like everyone's doing that now and everyone knows the defense so it's almost like you almost have to go back to the basics go back yeah. to the original stuff the old school jiu-jitsu that works and I think Ross is going to struggle maybe I'm going to have to revise my pick in the ADCC setting where a lot of the old school jiu-jitsu comes out. Is there. You know, it's like, but you also have to look at Craig Jones who recently won by old school, rear naked, right, but then also by new school, heel hook. The thing is with Craig, I think Craig is super well-rounded. Craig can do jiu-jitsu <laughs> as an old school type competitor, but he yeah. can bring the new school too. You know, it's Agreed. like kind of like Gordon Ryan in that sense. Agree. Where they can do it all and that's just well-coached stuff. We talked a little bit about TriStar with Rory earlier. There's another TriStar guy in Polaris 9. Who was it? Oh, Ethan. Yeah. Bernstein, yeah. And I think he's TriStar, but he's also Henzo, Dana Hare. I think he oh, jumps. they go back, back and, and forth. forth. Yeah. The only time they've ever had beef is when it's uh, GSP versus Matt the Terracera. Oh because yeah, Matt the Terra Matt was a predates guy. Yeah. He predates Dana Hare. Although now even the are Sarah B, uh, Matt Sarah BJJ and uh, Henzo on good terms. I don't even know. They are absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Okay. I heard he's got his own thing. Though. I heard a podcast the other day. I mean, they're separate. Sarah they're not, Longo, they're not right equal, now. but they're separate. Right. Um, Ethan did amazing. 
speaking of Ethan, I think he, he dominated. He was fighting a, uh, I think he was an Irish black belt who well-versed in the leg locks and a lot of leg entanglements, and Ethan was around all of it. He dominated, took the back, had to hold the back for a long time. He, the guy, Ethan was doing a really good job defending the back. He was like, he kept moving. He had the smoothest leg transitions, like on the, the hook. When he was, uh, not the hook, the, um, the, tri the triangle of the body. Every time Ethan moved to one side to get out, he moved the leg immediately to the other side. That's and then smart. he did it almost like instinctively without even like thinking about it. Like it was yeah. like drilled in him so much that he got to the point where it was just like. And where his arms moving at the same time. Yeah, he was going after the neck while he was doing it. Yeah. It was like some crazy stuff. Your brain's got to move that way. Oh man, and he, Tom was helpless. He was sitting there, he was like, I don't know how to fuck get out of this yeah. move. He was in that rear naked for five minutes before it was finally too much. And, I feel you. And he got him. And I think Ethan is a monster. I think I think he's in 66 kilograms in the ADCC. I'm not sure if he's 77 or 66, but he's a definite monster. He's going to do really good. Nice. Um, and I think, yeah, go ahead. But my favorite yeah, the stand up right? my favorite stand up thing from Polaris wasn't on the main card and was in the gi which i know you're not the biggest gi fan i'm a man who's trained in the gi for 2 years so i'm entitled to my opinion about of course no and i'm not saying right the I, kimono i personally when i grapple i i don't have any, much experience in gi i i do yeah. know gi and i like that aspect of it but and usually gi fights tend to be, you know, a lot of stalling and some perceive it as being boring. But the Tommy Langeker versus, um, what was the dude's name? It was, I think it was Sebastian Broch or, or I forget. Anyway, he, Sebastian Broch is, I think that was his name, is, uh, it was a big time yoga guy. Big guy in, uh, yoga guy. Yeah, huge. He's, but he actually started the whole yoga for BJJ thing. Well, I would look into that. Well, well, probably in the old days. Before Hicks and Gracie? No, yeah. But I'm saying like, he's popularized it. Like, okay, I'll and, take that. Yeah, and he had some fantastic work, and he's well-known in the community. Tommy just brought it to him. It was like the most aggressive gi match I've seen in a long time. They were constantly going after submissions. I would recommend it highly for anyone. Yeah. And Tommy looks amazing. I think that he called out Keenan after the fight. I would love it. I would watch a American match. Jiu Jitsu gi specialist. If it's Keenan versus Tommy Langaker, would be an awesome, awesome gi match to watch. Yeah, I think uh, just because you kind of pointed out my thoughts on it, all I could say is it's not impossible to have exciting matches in the gi, but going back to our, all of our discussions about rule sets and incentives, the gi incentivizes people to stall. Gordon Ryan, you know, one of the best on the planet, if not the best right now says that blue belts in the gi, if they want to and they intend to, can just hold him. Whereas if it's no gi, he's subbing 99% of the people <laughs> on the planet. So that to me says a lot. The mindset of individuals can overcome the systems. As we said, there's a balance between individuals and systems between rule sets and incentives. So it's not that people in the gi are prohibited from having awesome fights. I mentioned Chrome before earlier. He always had exciting fights. I'm sure Craig Jones and Gary Tonin were amazing in the Gi. I'm sure Dylan Danis, for all the hate he gets, was, was great in the Gi. Kenan Cornelius is known as a, a great Gi fighter. I think it's a good intro. It's a good way to super, learn Jiu Jitsu, you know? Super. Edwin Najimi has, has a video series from in the Gi, but all of the moves he teaches, Darces, Triangles, Rear Nakeds, they're all things that you could do outside of the gi. Of course. So it, 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 it ultimately depends on your decision making when you're in the gi or the kimono. But I think it lends itself, as well as the IBJJF point system, in addition to the gi, mm. lends itself to more boring matches than a no gi match. Oh, I think, only I match, think if they make, like I think if they, they don't really often do this rule set, but if they did gi where you submission only, There'd be a lot of fun. Like the High Rollers BJJ event we went to. Yes, gi submission only is great. I'm into that. I'm more interested in it. <laughs> you know? I'll say that. Um, I know that you're, you're forever going to be no gi all day, but... Um, what? what? <laughs> I think that, for me, that was the, the best match of the night at Polaris. That's good, man. That's good. I'm, I'm done on my end. Any, anything we missed? Anything? Any last... Comments, concerns, questions. <laughs> I feel like we covered a lot of the events that happened, but still managed to only scratch 10% of 
all the events that took place this past hey, weekend. Hey man, it's just slowly but surely we're two gonna guys get, and two cents. We're gonna get maybe four cents. We're gonna get to the point where we cover everything we want to cover to the extent that we want to cover it. Um, but for now, I think that was a good effort. All right, call the office. <laughs>